Captain and Tangela too. And our host, Vincent Van Dahl. And he brings it to ya! Creature features! And all creatures! Where in God's name is he? Livingston! Oh, Livingston! The guest car broke down. He drove down the hill to pick him up. I thought that was one of your many duties to perform. Yeah, it is. And I would have done it, but I didn't feel like doing it. Absolutely not. I've seen you drive a motor car. I shall not put the lives of the good denizens of Bodega Bay at risk merely to collect a stranded guest. Onward. Welcome to Creature Features. I'm your host, Vincent, the lovely lass over here, who has made more than one instructor cringe at the Department of Motor Vehicles, is the otherwise sweet and dainty Miss Tangella. The disembodied voice you heard me a moment ago would be our not-so-handyman Andrew, and the tall bloke who would normally be stood over to this side hurling forth snide remarks about our program, but has instead chosen to portray an Uber driver in an effort to benefit the show, is my otherwise polite and reliable butler, Mr. Livingston. In any case, have we an absolutely fabulous presentation in store for you tonight. First, we'll be joined again by our old friend Lance Ozanix, frontman for the popular musical troupe called Schizo. He'll tell us what he and the band have been up to as of late, recount for us again his numerous appearances on the Jerry Springer Show, tell us about his transportation issues, as well as chime in about tonight's film, which happens to be The Creeping Terror. Wait, didn't we just show this film last weekend? The Creeping Flesh with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. Our viewers love that film. Since the titles are so similar, I have little doubt that they will love this film as well. Worst movie ever made. Almost unwatchable. Oh dear. In any case, I have little doubt that there'll be more than a few of you out there who will truly enjoy this film and will find it to be a classic. Right. And we're sure some of you will find this film to be a classic sci-fi gem from the 50s. My goodness. Tangella wants you to know that she finds this film and its monster to be rather... poopy. And she says next week's movie will be quite better. Happy now? Good. So, that's about that. So, don't go away, for it is to be another night of poopy monster fright right here on Creature Features. Stay tuned. Portions of this program are brought to you by Micromat, making products that keep your Macintosh running at its best. Welcome to Creature Features. It's your favorite time of the week. Actually, it's not their favorite time of the week. It's my favorite time of the week. Now, all, all I do is sit around in this musty old mansion and, and wait for Saturday. I've got nothing better to do. Anyways, uh, thank you for joining us. We are with Lance Ozanix. Been a long time, Lance. Yes, it has. You know, he is world famous. You're going to find out why soon. But uh, one of the things you do is music. Another thing you do is vomit. And then there's other things you do as well. 
Yeah, some horror movies and horror, and we're going to talk about the horror movies. You know, I I don't know why you did not tell me about these horror movies last time you were here. Oh, well, they're pretty bad. Oh. Well, that's all we do here. That's what we serve. That's that's all uh, that's all that's all soup du jour on creature features, bad films. So, we we're, we're happy to talk about them. Anyways, how was the trip up? Uh Call trouble, I heard. I ran out of gas. You know, your car did not even break down. You simply ran out of petrol. Yeah, but thank God somebody picked me up. Mr. Livingston, you know, he's he's good at things like that. You know, Andrew should have been the one to, to drive down there, but I, I'm told he did not want to do so. So you got Livingston, and he's a better driver anyways. Yeah, he yeah. was awesome. So uh, we're going to watch The Creeping Terror. Have you seen this film? A long time ago. Right, right. And? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I, yeah right. you know. No, we've got a yeah. That's a, that's a start. That's, it is. That means give it give it a chance, right? Sure. I Maybe? Would. No? Oh, who knows? I, you know, I've looked at like three minutes of this film and it looks, it looks horrid. And not in the horror movie horrid manner, but in the bad movie poorly produced manner. I agree. You agree. All right. All right. But, you know, it was apparently done on a low budget. So we should maybe give it a chance because, you know, that's what low budget productions do is they produce things as best they can. And this is obviously someone's best effort, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so maybe maybe somebody out there put all their heart into this film. We'll see. All right. Anyways, uh, we're going to get back to you soon. And then uh, let's go ahead and start rolling the creeping terror. We shall see you on the other side of the break. Martin Gordon. The lovely girl beside him is Brett, his bride of two wonderful weeks. It's late August. They're returning from their honeymoon to their home in quiet, peaceful Angel County, California. Martin's Uncle Ben is sheriff of Angel County, and Martin is his senior deputy. Martin has high hopes of succeeding his uncle when Ben retires. But for now, Martin has only the thoughts emotions, and pride of a very happy, newly married young man. Brett is his, and he feels no man could ask for more. And now, without warning, their honeymoon is to become a nightmare. Neither Martin nor Brett saw the glowing rocket descent early morning sky. It was reported to the sheriff's office by Jeff, 
the county forest ranger. Jeff reported to Sheriff Ben that a plane had crashed near Willow Creek and that he was going out to investigate. Ben said he would join him as soon as possible. Barney, Ben's junior deputy, was to summon medical aid and to see if he could rouse someone at the Air Authority in San Francisco. plane crash down the road a couple of miles. I'm going to be a little short-handed until help gets here. Pull around back of me. Come along, both of you. Get in, honey. At the location of the crash, they discovered Jeff's truck, but Jeff himself was not around. They proceeded with their investigation. rocket in utter amazement. A puzzled Ben finally asked Martin what he made of the craft. It's no airplane. Could be one of our missiles. Or one of theirs. You could be right, honey. Don't think we have anything this big.
then could not understand why the craft wasn't severely damaged. That belongs to Jeff Peters. Jeff! Jeff! Jeff, are you in there? Martin, go back to my car and get my flashlight. in there. I think I hear him moving inside. Maybe he's hurt. Ben, please don't. Show stay at Hotel E on Courthouse Square in Santa Rosa. Back to Creature Features. If you are just joining us, we are with Mr. Lanzo Zanix from Schizo. And I want to talk about Schizo in a moment. But uh, we are watching the Creeping Terror. In this film, I read that the monster that is in this film is not the original monster they had planned to use. They had created something much more impressive and it was stolen. I mean, who steals a Hollywood monster? I mean, it's not like you can sell it on Craigslist. No, nope, not back then. No, not, definitely not back then because the computers were difficult to obtain. Right? No. Anyway, so uh, the monster you see is uh, made from carpet, I'm told. I don't know if it's shag. I suppose. So if this film was made in the early 60s, would it have been shag or would it have been like some other type of polyester? Who knows? I vote shag. Who cares? Maybe there's a giant Velcro. <laughs> a giant Velcro beast. No, no, no. Well, you know they get Velcro from a, an animal called the Velcris. No, they, they take the males and the females and they separate them. And then they, they shear them like sheep. And then they put them on clothing. They, I've seen it on shoes. It, it's called Velcro. It's amazing. You should try it. It's fine. So. All right. Anyways, uh... We'll get back to this film in a moment, but we're going to chat about Schizo, your band. Tell me something wonderful. What are you up to? New album? Uh, yeah, a new vinyl coming out next year. You're doing vinyl? Yeah. Why? I like it. Well, it makes it difficult to sell CDs if you produce your album on vinyl, does it not? Uh, we'll do both. Oh, you do both? Yeah. All right. So, so the, who, who buys vinyl records? A lot of Europeans. Europeans? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're odd like that, are they not? Yeah. No, they, they want to place the needle and they want to hear that click, click sound that occurs before a song starts, which makes sense because, you know, I remember when I was young and I listened to records all the time and then when I went to tape and CD, it was like, where's the click? 
you know, it's it's like a, a traditional sound you hear before a song. It's like, you know, when I when I moved from tape and C D from records, I missed that sound. I wanted to like actually have them place that sound. So I'm 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 blabbering. Tell me so tell me about the new album on vinyl. Uh yeah, just um it's like a best of. Uh it's been forty years since you know, since we started this group. You've been doing this band for forty years. Nineteen eighty one. My goodness. Yeah. And so uh it'll be this will be our twentieth release and uh it's it's gonna we're going big. So it's the best of forty years of music. Yeah. I don't even think the Rolling Stones done anything like this, have they? Oh yeah. They have? No, because they will do like the best of the last five years. Well, haven't they been around for like 80 years? Ooh, yeah, I think at least 80 years. I mean, uh, they were playing guitars in London during the Victorian age. No, I'm sure. I, look at Keith Richards. Yeah, we, we've got to clean up this planet and so we can leave something to Keith Richards when we're gone, right? No, so, all right, so how many songs on that album? Are you limited by the vinyl? Yeah, um, 10 songs. 10 songs, right. Yeah, including, yeah, that's about right. Our, including our new one uh, called Pieces. Pieces. And, yeah, and we got a how new How do you spell video. it? You know, like, uh, like Pieces, like Reese's Pieces. Oh, Reese's Pieces, all right. No, Pieces is good. Yeah. Pieces is good, right. Piece is good, whether it's a piece of something or it's actual piece. Is good. Right. All right, we're going to talk some more about your album in a second, but we got to get back to the film. And then uh, we're also going to talk about some other stuff. We, we have to, you know, a lot of people have not seen you on this program before, so they don't know the whole Jerry Springer thing. So you're we're going to talk about that. You're not going to make me do that, are you? No. Oh, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Not at all, not at all. All right, stick around. You guys stick around, and uh, let's get back to The Creeping Terror, 1964. Within the hour, Martin's unusual call for assistance was answered by a special unit led by a Colonel James Caldwell. Let's get going. Let's go, let's go. Move it over. Let's get going. Let's go. Let's go. All right, back on the truck. Let's go. The sergeant reported seeing an amazingly large creature in the aft section of the strange craft. He further reported that it was secured by a kind of metal harness, 
but that the creature could still move around somewhat, and for that reason, they had not gotten too close to it. There was no trace of either Ben or Jack. The colonel ordered continuous guard duty around the spaceship and decided to set up a temporary military headquarters at the sheriff's office in town. By the next day, Colonel Caldwell had the situation well in hand. He had called Washington and received his orders from the highest possible authority. He was to maintain tight security and to await the arrival of a Dr. Bradford, who had been on assignment at the Jodrell Bank Radio Observatory in England. Upon arrival, Bradford was to take complete charge of the operation. He was the world's leading authority on space emissions and had worked out a series of systems that might lead to communication with other forms of life when, as, and if they were contacted. Martin was outraged by the government's intellectual approach to a monster that had already killed and caused the disappearance of his two close friends. Caldwell tended to agree with him, but stated he had to follow his orders. One of those orders was to suppress the news of the death of Ben and Jeff. Martin was appointed temporary sheriff, and all news intended for public consumption was to emanate from his office. The Air Authority issued a cover-up story that a plane had crashed and burned, and this was to suffice until the experts cleared up the mystery of the visitor from outer space. In a remote section of the county, the first of a series of tragedies took place. Tragedies that would have been avoided had the public been warned. Later that day, while they were awaiting the arrival of Dr. Bradford, Martin instructed Barney, on advice from Colonel Caldwell, to plant in the local papers the news that Ben and Jeff had taken off on a fishing trip to British Columbia. The Colonel had impressed the bereaved families with the necessity of maintaining secrecy, and these brave relatives had agreed.
Despite Brett's inquiries about what Martin had seen in the spacecraft, he avoided specific details for fear of disturbing her more than she was. If the truth were known, Martin was more than a little disturbed himself. Shortly thereafter, Dr. Bradford arrived. He was a much younger man than one would imagine him to be. Martin, I'd like for you to meet Dr. Bradford. I've heard a lot about you from the colonel. Well, nothing bad, I trust. Martin and his wife were in the original party that found the fallen craft. I was sorry to hear about your uncle. It's a tough break. I hope you're feeling better. Yes, thank you. A couple hours of sleep did a world of good. Bradford thanked the colonel for his assistance and then asked to speak to Martin. Bradford questioned Martin about everything that had transpired. Martin did his best to recall everything in precise detail, but really didn't have much for him. The two soldiers that entered the rocket earlier had been summoned, and Bradford hoped to learn more from them. The doctor himself would not enter the rocket until the arrival of certain equipment. From his discussion, it was apparent that the doctor considered this situation a magnificent opportunity for mankind. He felt that if he could communicate with the creature, it might be possible to advance human knowledge by years or even centuries. The spaceship alone signified an intellectual development far in advance of anything on Earth. When Martin asked him how he intended to protect himself from the creature, Bradford said not to worry, that he hadn't come here to be victimized either by his own or the creature's fears. This is Livingston, and you're watching Creature Features. Not now. Stay tuned. Creature Features is brought to you by CreatureFeatureStore.com, the official merchandiser of Creature Feature accessories. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Lance. We'll be back shortly, but we're going to take this opportunity to do mail because that's that's the thing we have to do, right? We have to, unfortunately. No. Well, they, we get so much of it. If we did nothing, it would pile up. It does. Yeah. I wonder if people knew what we do with the mail after we get it. Do they want to know? No. We he, He's got a large bird. He, he lines the cage with it. Unless it's like something made out of rubber, then... You won't use it for your cage now, will you? No. All right. Anyways, uh, let's do some mail, and then uh, we'll get back to this film, The Creeping Terror. Tangela's favorite film, right? How are you, old man? I'm well. Thank you for I, picking up our guest today. I'm not old. You know, you should have let Andrew do it. Andrew refused to do it. No, he could have done it. All right, this note is from somebody named Aulene Rose Van Halister. Aulene. Is that a real name? Aul. It would appear to Lean. be. I like it. No, it should be. I, I, I bet somewhere in my ancestry there's a person named Aulene. Oh, I bet too. somebody in her ancestry. I like your umbrella. Or is that a parasol? Parasol. All right. Uh, it's got to be waterproof to be an umbrella, right? Yes. All right. So uh, she goes, uh, I have just now come upon your programming and have become substantially addicted. That's a potential for a lawsuit, is it not? How so? Well, maybe she stopped going to work. Maybe she stopped caring for her young due to this new addiction. Her young? I don't know. I'm assuming. I'm making assumptions. I could do that, you She's know. She's not actually an owl. No, I'm sitting know. in the yellow chair. I can make assumptions. Don't judge me. As I am not a watcher of television, this is quite remarkable for your program. I find it to be interesting and informative, and I relish each and every episode. I bet she's not going to relish this one. 
And not because of us, because of this film. It is a disaster. No. Well, you know, sometimes we have to show disasters. We've had this whole spate of wonderful films. And, you know, we've got to drop a little surprise in every now and then, right? Used to be the other way around, if you recall. We would have all terrible movies and occasionally a good one. That no. was our trademark. That's right. No, it still is. All right. Uh, do uh, continue to broadcast, for I do not wish to destroy any persons who try to remove my viewing pleasure. Oh, she's threatening anybody who would cancel us. I hope you broadcasters are listening because Aulene will be on your case if you cancel us. That's, that is after Tangela. Right? You would not want her to be cross with you. That's for sure. All right. Thanks for uh, writing, Aldine, and we hope everything is nice in wherever you live. Next up, Mr. Livingston. San Francisco. San Francisco. Mr. Dave Genera. Did we just hear from Dave Genera? I don't believe so. We heard from Dave Genera a couple of weeks ago. All right. That's fine. Keep writing to us, Dave, especially since you're selling us these quality Hallmark cards. It's uh, pretty daisies, right? These are pretty daisies, right? All right, to Vincent Livingston and the one and only Tangella. David of SF, just want to thank you for reading my letter on the air. So he sent us a letter to thank him for reading his letter. So now he's got to send us another letter thanking us for, write, for reading this one, right? No. This is an endless cycle. You know, if you write to us again, Mr. Genera, I'm not going to read it this time. But I will read this one. Hope you guys are doing something good and spooky for Halloween. Oh, well, Halloween was, what, last week? Last week. Last week, all right. So this is kind of a, you know, if we would have seen this was a Halloween card, we probably would have read it last week. And he probably sent us a Halloween card as well. Did he not? I don't know. All right. Something spooky for Halloween we did. Tangella. Of all the others, Elvira, Lily of the Munsters, and Morticia of the Adams Family, in my opinion, you're the best. If you ever get a chance, find and listen to this record called Spooky. Sorry, don't remember the artist, but it fits you perfectly. So anyways, thanks again, Tangella and everyone else. Just a fan, David, San Francisco, California. Well, thank you again, Dave. And uh, no need to thank us this time for reading your notes on the air. And Spooky, I know this song. Who does that song? It's on the radio, continuously. It's an right. older tune, I think from the 70s. It's an perhaps. older tune. Maybe 60s. It's called Spooky. And it's about a woman... Yeah, you know, she's not spooky. You know, you should suggest a song called Terrifying. That would be the one that covers her. Spooky is okay. Indeed. Oh, look at this. Oh, it's decorative. It's like uh, Halloween-like, right? It looks more like no, no. zombies. No, she, she put, what do you call these things again? Zombies. No, I know they're zombies. What do you call the small icons? Icons. No, they're not. What did you call them? It was a Japanese name. Emojis. Emojis. So she's got, it's, no, it's Dracula, and then it's a male zombie and a female zombie. And I think what she's trying to portray here, Kayla Summers, is that you are Dracula, and then yes. her and I are zombies. Indeed. I could be wrong. And uh, anyways, uh, subject, love you all. Love the show. You guys make horror so much fun. I have a movie for you that I think will even scare the... Uh, all these symbols, which I imagine means something four-letter word like, right? Uh, that will even scare Tangella and Mr. Livingston is a 1970 West German horror film that is to some extent factually based. It was filmed on location in Austria, an actual castle that was used in the early 1700s to carry out this horror using actual torture instruments for the museum inside the castle. Wikipedia has a great write-up on it. It is called Mark of the Devil. I've seen this film. Have you? Well, of course I've seen Mark of the Devil. Hmm. Yeah. It was, it was all over Europe in the 70s. Where were you? Not watching Mark of the Devil, obviously. Uh, it's a, in, in its historical aspect of the witch interrogations in filming inside the actual castle. And a no holes barred script that makes this film. University of Venice did a class on it a few years ago. Get your popcorn ready. This one's a doozy. Love you guys, Kayla. All right, Kayla, you know, I looked into Mark of the Devil some time ago because I wanted to show it prior to your lovely notes. And uh, that's going to be a tough one to get. 
There's ah. something weird about it. I cannot find a distributor that will allow us to put it on YouTube. Yeah, that's half the problems with getting some of these films is we can get them for broadcast on television, right? But it's getting the permission to put them on YouTube and we will not do one without the other. So that's what we do, right? Right. right. What in God's name is that? Somebody send me a pizza? That's a thought. A pizza. Somebody sent me a bloody pizza. What flavor? <sighs> it's not a pizza. It's not. Well, the box is actually not square. What was this box? It's an AT&T box. What came in this box? Printed on recycled, 2018. AT&T Intellectual Property. You know, there could be a phone switch center inside of this box, I don't know. Keyboard or All something. All right, here we go. It's got a letter. Why don't you display some of the things here, if you would, and I shall read the letter. All right. What do we got? Oh, there's an extra fancy thing in here. Is there? Look at this. Oh. Moolah, moolah, moolah. All right. The letter goes. Dear Vincent Van Dahl, Tangela, and Mr. Livingston, greetings from Ivan and Issa in Ukiah. Backwards spelt haiku. I never knew that. Did you know that? Ukiah haiku, yes. I never knew this. Well, I, I don't watch those backward programs like you do. Love you guys and support your noble endeavor. We are sure it is a good thing that in support. Look, he sent us a check for 100 American dollars. Now, really? This can go to some good. This will go to like An Andrew's bandage fund, right? That's a Help good idea. Cure. Thank you for your generosity. I like to see my favorite, The Lost Skeleton of Cadavra. I've never heard of this film. Neither have I. Well, we're going to look into it, right? Indeed. I'm an old rocker. What are you showing? Is that him? Oh, look at this. That's, is that him? I'm an old rocker from the psychoramic 60s, aware of the creepy side of life, death, and the horrors of music. Biz. Those evil, diabolical tyrants, scumbags, greedy monsters, blood-sucking leeches at our record companies. I agree with you 1,000%, sir. No, they are. those. They, I think he missed a couple of adjectives and nouns. He has no interest in my my gripe with record companies. I'm looking for dangerous things in the box. Oh, no, he, he goes on. Ravenous vultures, rip-off lying B-words, illegal, amoral, backstabbing mutants, the record labels, booking agents, and crooked promoters. This man definitely is a bona fide musician if he knows all these things. It's the truth, you know. But I'm preaching to the choir. We survive. Can you show a movie where the creature devours all those people? Well, you know, if there's not a movie that has that, I think we should make it, sir. Thank you so much for writing. Thank you for the wonderful gifts. And uh, we will see you sometime soon. That it? That would be it. That is it for mail. If you'd like to send us a letter of your own, send it to the email address you see appearing over here. Or if you'd like to send a pizza box full of wonderful items, send it to the address you see right here. We will be right back soon with Lanzo Xenix, but first let's get back to the Creeping Terror.
Barney. We'll be right out. Well, that's all right. Just take your time. I didn't know we had company. Look at me. I, I'm a mess. Don't be impolite. I get the drink. Nice talking, honey. What do you have, Barney? How about a bourbon and seven? Coming up. Would you get the seven, honey? Barney, you should try marriage. It would do wonders for you. Barney and Martin had been bachelor buddies for years. But now that Martin was settling down to marriage, they were slowly drifting apart. Barney, naturally, was still dating all the girls in town, and he couldn't understand why Brett and Martin didn't pal around with him more than they did. He couldn't comprehend that married life brought with it not only new problems and duties, but the necessary togetherness of husband and wife as well. Despite Brett's most tactful considerations, such as inviting him over to dinner quite often, Barney was growing resentful of her, or at least she felt that he was. Since time began, this change in relationship has probably happened to all buddies in similar circumstances. Life has its way of making boys grow up, and with marriage, Martin's time had come. His life was now Brett a life that he thoroughly enjoyed. The next morning, Betty Johnson, as usual, blew a goodbye kiss to her husband, but for the last time. Mommy, take your temperature. baby. You'll feel better soon.
Portions of this program are brought to you by Micromat, making products that keep your Macintosh running at its best. It's Creature Features Night. You know, they're talking about making it an actual annual holiday, Creature Feature Night. But, you know, we do this 52 weeks a year. So you cannot make it one night, right? That would be wrong. Right. Right. All right. Anyways, welcome back to the show. We are watching The Creeping Terror with our friends Lance Ozenix from the band Schizo. I love that name. And you use a Z instead of... <laughs> Well, how would you normally spell schizo? Uh, S-C-H-I-Z-O. Oh, that is a proper way. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know, I always thought schizo proper was spelled T-S-O or something like that. That's close enough. Right. Oh, but, you know. oh. hey, you know that song, Spooky, from the letter section? The one that was mentioned from a writer, yes. Right. That was the band called Classics 4. Classics Fool. Yeah, they're a great uh, kind of like a early '60s well, goth band. What kind of name of a band is Classic Fool? Were they prior Classic One, Two, and Three? Um, Have they now moved on to Six, Seven, Eight, Nine, Ten? I don't know. I mean, was there four members of the band? Maybe Classics with four. I believe you're right. Like the Jackson Five, or yeah. maybe the la the last name was Classics. No, your last name is Ozanix. That sounds like classics, right? Right. Classics, Ozanix. Who knows? Maybe they had a, a band called Schizo at some point. And you took it over next. Uh, anyways, this film, you know audio. What is going on with this film? Because the audio does not seem right. And there's narration. Correct. Um, somehow they lost all of the audio during the filming of this. I think what happened was is uh, I think a car with the audio equipment fell in the um, lake and then they had to do narration to, to try to fix the film. Fell into a lake? This, or, this production yeah. has not had much luck now, has it? No wonder it's one of the worst movies ever made. You know, as you watch this, keep in mind that all kinds of accidents, I think it was a cursed film. That's all it could be. That's the only explanation, right? It was a cursed film. And you know what's funny about that part, though, is many films never even record audio. They go out and they shoot, and they would they go back later in the studio with the script, and they have the actors watch the the, the lips and, and reread the lines. Oh, right. That's how all the Sergio uh, Leone films, the, like, uh, the... Yeah, you know, the Clint Eastwood westerns, the spaghetti westerns. Oh yes. Those, all those films, none of them, none of the audio is recorded except for the Americans. They record the Americans. That's all. Wow. That's what I'm told. I saw this on A and E. Anyways, uh, let's get back to this film, and uh, when we come back, uh, you're gonna tell us about these movies you were in, right? Sure. All right, off we go back to the creeping terror. Don't you dare go away. Grandpa, can I go for a walk? 
All right. Let's stay close by. Bobby? Bobby? Bobby! Within 48 hours, Dr. Bradford had closely examined the creature and the spaceship and reached a number of conclusions. He was sure the creature had come from beyond our solar system because it adapted to our environment so quickly, and no planet or dead star near us has conditions similar to the Earth. Of special interest to him was the hull of the ship. It was composed of an alloy unlike anything human science had ever encountered. The doctor had run a number of tests on the metal, but its molecular structure remained a mystery. Because there was no food on board, Bradford presumed the creature had been in a state of suspended animation, particularly because it had survived the trials of re-entry and impact without apparent harm. 
So far, he had no success in communicating with it. But he had not yet exhausted all possibilities. On a more subjective basis, he had the curious feeling that the creature did not want to communicate with him. Such a confession on the part of this eminent scientist made Martin feel quite apprehensive. While on a routine call to pick up instructions from Colonel Caldwell, Martin received an urgent message from Barney. Barney was at Willow Creek. He had responded to a phone call from a frantic Mrs. Brown. Her husband and grandson had gone fishing and were long overdue. Barney was instructed to organize a search party locally and to report the results to Martin. Because of security regulations, he was not to come near the area of the spacecraft. Martin said he would join Barney later if he could. Acting on a hunch, Martin decided to see for himself if the monster was still there. It was. Bradford had installed TV cameras inside the spaceship and was testing the creature's reactions to sound, light, electricity, color, and air pressure. When Martin asked him if he had any luck in communicating with the beast, Bradford confessed that he hadn't, but would try again when certain data was returned to him from computer processing. It was at this time that Bradford came up with a frightening theory, namely that the creature might be a product of engineering, the same engineering that built the spaceship. What he didn't understand was why some form of communication had not been built into the creature. When Martin asked him if this weren't something to worry about, Bradford said no. It was probably his own failing at not being able to establish communication. It seemed to Martin that if Bradford's theory were correct, humanity might be in grave danger. Bradford dismissed Martin's fears by pointing out that the creature was not exhibiting any signs of violence, and besides, it was firmly secured by the harness. That afternoon in Muncrief Park, a group of neighbors got together for a hootenanny. Oh, she left me sad, but still I am happy. In fact, I am glad, for I am as free as that bird in the tree, cause she left me alone and could not marry me. I said that I loved her and would till I died. I tried to forget her. And I really did try, but I'll still think of her till the day that I die. Because I think, You stay there. Stay calm.
Hi, this is Ron from Pacifica. Um, just wanted to say your show is really good. Um, I used to, you know, watch the original Creature Features. Anyway, I'm looking to find a campy old film from the early 60s called Day of the Triffids. I'm sure it wouldn't be too expensive for you guys to get because it's probably not like a super in-demand movie. Anyway, you guys are great. See you later. Portions of Creature Features are brought to you by... The Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. Explore the mystery at winchestermysteryhouse.com. Who does your hair? Um, <clears throat> my mom's a hairdresser, actually. His mom does his hair. My mother, you know what she would do to my hair? If I gave her scissors in hand and said, have at it, I would, I would, I would look like somebody in the military. <laughs> no, she would, she would give me like the buzz cut. It'd be terrible. What have I hit in front of me here, sir? Well, you got a couple of movies I did. Two movies that Lance... So you did not tell me that you're not just a musician, but you are a thespian as well. Sure. And look, this film called Holy Moldy, that is you on the cover. Yeah. Look at this. Holy Moldy. Hopefully a, I can a scan. A possessed demon. But you're a possessed demon with green hair. And it looks like lipstick. No lipstick? That's just the artwork. This looks wonderful. So how did you end up in this uh, arrangement? Um, it's a movie that we did back in 1992, um, shot on video. And, right. Uh, 1992? Yeah. My goodness, how old were you back then? I was a young man. Far younger than you are now. Far younger than I am now. Far younger than I was then, Yeah. I think. Probably. And then uh, a L.A. company called Verboden Video um, picked it up and distribute it and it's uh, going pretty good i like it that's wonderful and uh this one is more recent um janina and the creatures from outer space part two that's a local movie uh done by uh sandy and marilyn lane right yeah and what's it about um just what the title says there's belly dancers and creatures from outer space and Rock and roll. I did not know there was belly dancers in outer space. Is yeah. This, is this part of like NASA's training <laughs> that they put belly dancers in orbit? No, they could go up there and entertain William Shatner. Uh, absolutely. Right? He would love it. No, yeah, that, that bloke, speaking of which, no, he, he will not come in this program, but he will go into space. Yeah. On a, on a rocket shaped like a you-know-what. That's right. No, it's terrible. That's, but no, this film is not terrible. That occurrence is terrible. Creatures from outer space. How wonderful. How long is this film? Um, they're around a half hour. Half hour. You know, if they would just film a full-length movie, we'd be happy to show them here on Creature Features. But no, we cannot do a half-hour film because it will be due the rest of the time. Like, look at Tangela make faces of the camera. It would, it would not be a fun program. We would need to have the actual full-length film. So uh, that's, that's wonderful. Are you going to do another film soon? Yeah, hope so. I hope so. You should do another film because, you know, you are, while you were quite handsome back then, I think now you look more like, you know, someone who might do Shakespeare. Oh, definitely. You no, know, I could see you with like a sword or like a, a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You could be... You could be the bloke with the coconuts. Wait, that scene in Monty Python. I think I suit better as bring me a bucket. Remember bring, that oh, scene? no, no, no. We're not going to. That's <laughs> that's a life. Uh, that's a life of Brian. And no, no, that's a meaning of life, right? Meaning of life. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was a terrible scene. Oh, that was a wonderful scene. But it was terrible. <laughs> All right. I'm getting silly. We need to get back to the film. So uh, let's get back to the creeping terror. And when we come back, we're going to talk about all these appearances you did on television besides this one. Right? 
Right. Right. All right. Off we go. See you soon. In response to a multiple missing persons report, Martin and Barney searched the countryside for the group of picnickers. The only trace they found of them was the remains of a guitar one of them carried. This wholesale disappearance of a large group of people, coupled with earlier missing persons reports, led Martin to only one conclusion. There must be another monster, and it was on the loose. The colonel listened to Martin's theory, and after consulting with Bradford, decided to call Washington. He was told to follow his own good judgment, but under no circumstances was he to alarm the populace. The colonel decided to organize a countywide search. Martin's assignment was to search the north end of the county. While Martin and Brett were engaged by the search, the monster was moving toward the community dance hall.
आटा रल्ला पर रात का है
Guests of the show stay at Hotel E on Courthouse Square in Santa Rosa. Portions of this program are brought to you by Micromat, making products that keep your Macintosh running at its best. I wish you would stop doing that. While Martin and Brett were taking a break from the search, a call came through which confirmed Martin's theory. Colonel Caldwell told them of the monster's attack at the dance hall. His troops now had orders to destroy the monster and he asked for Martin's assistance. Martin said he would join the Colonel as quickly as possible. The monster next appeared in Lover's Lane. Anyone who experienced that catastrophe and survived would never go there again.
God. It was almost an hour before Caldwell learned of the monster's devastating new attack. Colonel Caldwell wasted no time ordering his men into action. It was at this point that Bradford interceded. He demanded that the monster be taken alive at all costs. The Colonel's protests about the dead and missing made no impression on Bradford. Caldwell conceded to the point of assuring Bradford that they would not destroy the monster if they could avoid it. Get on with it, Lieutenant. Pull it out, man. Hello, this is Mr. Livingston. It would appear I have been tasked with requesting you to help our show financially by visiting our patron page. Your generosity will help us keep Creature Features on the air. With only a few dollars a month from you, your kindness will allow us to continue creating new entertainment for your viewing pleasure each and every week. 
And if you have the desire to give more, you might even receive a gift from Tangela. I think not. Please visit the website below to learn more. Thank you. This portion of Creature Features is brought to you by CreatureFeatureStore.com, the official merchandiser of Creature Feature accessories. Welcome back to Creature Features. If you're just joining us, you're way too late and you should just watch something else because they've missed almost all the film. <laughs> they've missed some of your great stories. Lance Ozanix, our guest, has uh, all kinds of stories to tell, but we have not heard the best stories yet. So uh, may I divulge oh, your please. secret superpower? So uh, Lance is most famous for a, a technique he uses on stage, which is, uh, how do I put this delicately? Just pukes green on stage. He pukes during his shows. People go, they travel hundreds of kilometers to see you vomit on a stage. Yeah, not too many bands do it, so uh, we kind of You mean this is a thing? I hope not. Yeah, I, back when I was doing music, it's like, oh, yes, try to dance, you know, while the singer's singing and, you know. But no, no, they just throw up all over the stage. So uh, that's his magic trick, his, his, his gimmick, his, uh, what is it, your nom de plume. Shtick. Your shtick. And uh, that made him quite famous for shows like Jerry Springer. Yeah, four who, or five times. You've been on Jerry Springer four or five times. Yeah. My goodness. Even that bloke, that cooking bloke who lives here, has not been on Jerry Springer that oh, many times. Right. What's his name? Guy. Guy Fieri. Nice guy. I like is him. Is he a nice guy? Yeah. But he's not been on Springer and certainly not for doing the, the vomit routine five times. So you were on there five times. What's he like? Uh, very professional, but well, funny too. One would hope he's professional. I mean, he's, he, he's not gonna like not show up, right? right. And he's a politician. He's he was, a politician? He was a mayor of Ohio, I think, or something mayor. like that. Ooh. McCheese was also a mayor. I mean, anybody could be a mayor. If it's, it's just like you have to fill out a form and become popular. Right. I'm thinking of running for mayor of Bodega Bay. Do it. No, I should. You know why? Because I've got the nicest house and I could hold court right here in my home. I would not have to leave. Wouldn't that be nice? No. I, I, would, I would make free seafood day. Would be my first act of Congress. Would be free seafood day in Bodega Bay. And everybody in the world would come for free seafood. I've got to work out some details, but it's going to happen. So um, you were also on Judge Judy. Yes, that was uh, just once. Just That's once. all it took. Yeah. Right. I lost. You lost a, a legal case, which involved? Well, <clears throat> um, a concert patron came up, and um, I kind of like, puked on her $500 dress, and she sued me for the cost of the a dress. A concert patron. I've never heard that term before. Sure. A concert patron. Yeah. And so you proceeded to vomit upon a concert patron, and um, she was wearing a, a nice garment of some kind. Yeah. I, th I thought it was part of the show, so apparently she wasn't part of the show. You know, I, I think one night you should do a horror film of just you vomiting on different things. And that could fill a 90-minute slot, and we could show it. And I think two or three of our viewers would watch the show. I think I have a movie It's already out called Vomitorium. Oh, that'd be a good name for a, for a film. Yeah. All right. No, yeah, that'd be a horror film. All right. It's getting silly. <laughs> what do you say we finish this film, and uh, we find out what you're doing next afterwards? Great. All right. Off we go to pretty soon the conclusion of The Creeping Terror. It should be fun, because... This film will finally be over, right? Right? All right, see you soon. Bye.
When Martin's party arrived and offered to help, the colonel told them enough lives were being endangered. They were to be part of the second line of defense, to be used only if necessary. shaken man, returned babbling about what had happened. Caldwell, realizing the full danger of the situation, decided he had only one means left to stop the monster, grenades. Now Bradford made a drastic move. Acting on his superior authority, he forbade Caldwell to destroy the creature. The colonel, more concerned with saving human lives than advancing science, told Bradford to go to hell. Get out of my way. Where's he going in such a hurry? Maybe you'd better follow him. He may need help. You go ahead, Mark. I'll stay with him. Thank you. 
This is Livingston, and you're watching Creature Features. Stay tuned. Hair styling for the show is provided by Restoration Hair in Santa Rosa. loosened the harness on the monster and allowed it to escape. Martin tried to help the doctor, but there was no time. Bradford told Martin what he had just confirmed, that these monsters were highly specialized test animals. They were, in fact, mobile laboratories that consumed human beings in order to analyze them chemically. 
undoubtedly to detect weaknesses in the human species. He told Martin that the information fed into a computer in the spacecraft. Further, he added, now that both monsters were dead, the computer would activate a transmitter to send the results into outer space. Martin knew what he had to do. As Martin entered the spaceship, he heard the transmitter generator kick on. tough alloys of the spacecraft were not even dented by Martin's hammer. As the transmitter stopped, Martin felt sick. Evidently, all the information had been transmitted. On Martin's return, he confessed his failure. He slowly asked Bradford, what was in store for humanity? Bradford was pessimistic, but implied that maybe all was not lost. After all, he told them, the vastness of the universe is incredible. If these monsters had come from its outer limits, their home might even no longer exist. Or if they do come again, perhaps man will have advanced enough to cope with them and those who made them. Only God knows for sure were Bradford's last words to anyone on this earth. And that brings the coffin lid down on the creeping terror. Yeah, uh, uh, they blew it up. A carpet creature. They blew, it was carpet bombed, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, something like that, right? And uh, I, I think we've already established that uh, Tangela doesn't like... Do you still think it was poopy? <laughs> yeah, she's got some of the strangest adjectives I've ever heard. No, oh, she says poopy all the time. Those of you who, oh, I wish Tangela would talk. No, if you heard Tangela speak, she'd be saying poopy this and poopy that. That's what she says. 
The alternative, I suppose, is it's better than the alternative, right? She'd be using the S word. No, for, for such a violent young woman, she does not use four-letter words too often. She has all these nice little replacement words. Some of them are not so nice. Anyways, uh, Lance, what are you doing next? Uh, we're doing a big show coming up um, this Monday. This on Monday? November 8th. Your band? Yes, yeah, Schizo is... Playing is playing on Monday. Yeah, on Monday. A metal Monday. <laughs> this is... This is a, bands who play on Monday. They only they only play for headdresses, right? Well, no. This this Monday is a is a is a special touring act called Raven. They came all the way from England. To play. Oh, so this is this the other band you're playing with? Yeah. And they're called Raven. Yeah, they're so great. That's original. They've been around for years. That are they're classic metal. Well, you should have gone up to Hillsburg and played at the Raven Theater, right? Ooh, that'd be cool. That would have been nice. But instead, you're doing this at the Phoenix. Yes, in Petaluma. Theater. All ages. So, no, no. This is a this is an ancient theater from what? Twenties. Twenties, and they turned it into a venue, and it's haunted. Yeah. Now our director Tom has done a documentary, and he documents the the ghost that lives in the Phoenix Theater. So if you do see a ghost as you play, yeah, make sure you send him our regards. I certainly will. Right, right, good. So you're doing that, and then um, how do we learn more if Somebody wants to come see you guys. Uh, just go to our website. Website? Schiz yeah, schizo.biz. Schizo.biz? What in God's name is dot biz? It's cheap. Dot biz? <laughs> what does that mean, dot biz? You know about this dot biz? No? Well, it's not dot com. It's not dot co. It's not dot org. It's not dot net. What else is there? Dot biz. That's odd. All right works for me and they could uh, get information there and uh, purchase tickets if they want to come see you in person right sure right so you do the are you gonna do the thing um well it's a Monday he vomits on stage yeah maybe. you don't you don't do it on Mondays maybe oh do you do you play before the other band oh yes I'll play before. oh that's why he can he's gonna be careful of when he does this because the next band has to use the same stage right I'm professional about it though Oh. I use tarps. Oh, well, that makes it all better, does it not? All right. That's all I have to say about that. Anyways, thank you so much, Lance, for coming on the show tonight. We hope you have a successful show on Monday, and uh, good luck with the new album. I thank hope you. to hear it. Maybe you can send me... Oh, do you have a CD player anymore? Maybe you can send me one of those little thumb units. <laughs> right? Sure, I can do that. Because now I've learned how to use these, and I can listen to the music, and I can hear your new album, and uh, we'll see you next time you're in town, right? Thank you, yep. All right, sir. And as far as you guys go, thank you so much for staying up and watching this poopy movie with us. But our guest was wonderful, so that made up for it. And uh, next week, you said we've got something better, right? Much better? She has a surprise in mind. So uh, tune in next week. We'll see you then. Uh, have a wonderful Westview weekend, and we love you. So, uh, Lance, I'm thinking, you know, since you're so good at movies, and we've been talking about doing some kind of film... Maybe we could get you to do, like, you know, a soundtrack performance for the film. Yeah, I could, but how about if you just have me puke in the movie?